Uh, good evening uh, to all of you. Um, I am uh, very sorry. I can't be there in person, uh, but I guess you all understand the reasons and these are special circumstances. Um, so the plan for my lectures is um, to provide an introduction to aspects of dense matter physics um, and, uh, and its implications for astrophysics, particularly the astrophysics of neutron stars. Uh, I, I have four lectures planned for you, <clears throat> and in these four lectures, we're going to cover several topics. Um, and in preparing these topics, uh, I kind of used two important guiding principles. Uh, one was to uh, make sure that the concepts were clearly explained uh, and the emphasis is going to be on concepts. Uh, since I'm not there in person and since we don't have a blackboard, uh, I decided that, you know, that we'll try to leave out all the technical details and all the formal details associated with some of the calculations, just focus on important physics. And the other part of these lectures is uh, for you to get an appreciation of astrophysics uh, and its importance for understanding the QCD phase diagram. Uh, I, I realized that the main emphasis of the school, one of the main emphasis of the school is to understand strongly interacting matter and the other lecturers have talked about what we can learn uh, from lattice QCD, from uh, high energy QCD uh, as studied in the laboratory. Uh, in a sense, this lecture will complement that. Uh, and uh, the reason uh, we need to look to astrophysics is because uh, if we are interested in cold matter, where the temperature is very small compared to all other scales, then uh, the only way in which we can realize such matter in, is in neutron stars and uh, in the phenomena that neutron stars host. So we will really need to uh, do a little bit of astrophysics if we want to study the cold uh, phase, diag phase diagram of cold dense matter. So the four lectures that I have um, are roughly you know, you know, shown here. Uh, today, we'll, we'll just review things that I'm sure you all know. Uh, we'll start with some basic uh, notions of uh, quantum mechanics, uh, second quantization, uh, statistical mechanics, thermodynamics. Uh, then I'll talk about nuclear matter, nuclear interactions. Uh, and then I'll discuss what, uh, what are the physical principles involved in constructing states of matter that are in equilibrium. Uh, that are in equilibrium with reactions and are in uh, in bulk state where they are electrically neutral. Uh, and I'd like to break the lecture in the middle. You know, we have two hours is a long time uh, to pay attention. So at about an hour or so, uh, we can take a five or ten minute break, and you can ask me questions about. Uh, you can ask me questions throughout, but you know, during the break, you may you'll get a chance to ask me some questions. Um, and uh, tomorrow's lecture, we'll get into some more, uh, uh, some other details about other phases of matter uh, beyond nuclear matter. Uh, but today, we'll 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 just uh, focus on um, dense nuclear matter. Okay. So um, so let me begin by um, motivating why now is probably the most exciting time to study neutron stars. So this is in this is the era of what we call multi messenger astrophysics, uh, and the reason it's exciting is because this is the first time or, or the first decade in which we've been able to study neutron stars using almost every possible uh, messenger uh, that's available to us. So for a long time we've studied neutrino uh, neutron stars using radio waves. Uh, and we now study it very routinely using, you know, optical light, X-ray light, gamma, light, gamma rays. Uh, and in addition, uh, we've been studying neutron star phenomena by using three other sources of information. One of them is neutrinos, and uh, you know, in extremely uh, hot environments such as a supernova or a neutron star merger, uh, we'll discuss this in the uh, second lecture or the third lecture. Uh, we, neutron stars can produce lots of neutrinos, and these neutrinos can actually be detected in terrestrial detectors, uh, such as the Super Kamiokande detector in Japan. Uh, and 
all of us are very excited about the, the prospect of detecting uh, many more neutron star mergers in gravitational waves. And when two neutron stars collide, this will be a topic, we again, we'll discuss in the second and third lectures. Uh, they emit gravitational waves that can be detected here on Earth. And, uh, you know, there, there are detectors in Italy, there are, there is uh, LIGO in the United States, and we've already detected neutron star mergers uh, using gravitational waves. And, uh, and there is important information about high density matter that these gravitational waves contain. And in addition to photons, neutrinos, and gravitational waves, it turns out that when neutron stars go through very high energy phenomena, they eject matter. Uh, so either in a supernovae or in a neutron star merger, they eject uh, very neutron rich matter, which then forms some of the most heavy elements in the universe. So in addition to these three standard messengers, we can also study the heavy element abundances in the, in the universe and learn something about their origin inside neutron stars. So we, we are at a, at a very unique time in, uh, in the study of neutron stars where uh, almost every uh, source of information coming from astrophysics, uh, especially high energy astrophysics contains interesting information about dense matter in neutron stars. So um, the reason neutron stars are so important in multi-messenger astrophysics is because in fact, they are the only source that we know of that can produce all of these uh, messengers, uh, neutrinos, photons, and gravitational waves. Uh, you, you can think about a core collapse supernovae. A core collapse supernovae is the, you know, the end point of the evolution of a massive star where the inner core gets to the Chandrasekhar mass and it collapses. Uh, when it collapses, uh, it, it collapses from a radius of about 3,000 kilometers down to the neutron star size, which is about 10 kilometers. And there's an enormous amount of gravitational binding energy uh, that is released in the form of neutrinos. Uh, and so we can detect neutrinos from such uh, explosions in addition to all the light that we usually see from a supernova explosion uh, in, in detectors. And uh, the next time we, we see a supernova in our galaxy, it's likely that we will have, instead of 10 or so events that we detected last time, we will probably have 100,000 events uh, to study. Uh, and binary neutron star mergers, for a long time, we knew that they would produce uh, uh, gravitational waves that can be detected. In fact, um, LIGO was motivated and built because it was clear that neutron stars existed in binaries and that these neutron stars would coalesce. Uh, in, in, a, in a time scale of order of billion years, which would be observable uh, for in detectors like LIGO. Uh, in addition, I'll talk about uh, accreting neutron stars in uh, lecture three. And, uh, and the reason accreting neutron stars are interesting is because they are basically neutron stars where a neutron star has a companion. Uh, and this companion, uh, as you can see in this panel, panel here, uh, matter from the companion falls onto the neutron star, uh, and when it falls onto the neutron star, it produces intense X-ray radiation. And it also turns out that uh, the secretion onto neutron stars can heat its interior uh, and allow us to study some interesting properties of the neutron star interior. Uh, finally, gamma ray bursts still are pretty mysterious. We don't quite understand exactly how gamma ray bursts are produced, uh, but even in this context, we believe that neutron stars that are formed immediately after the collapse of very massive stars uh, creates an environment and an accretion disk uh, that, that is likely to power gamma ray bursts. In all of these cases, um, we need to understand properties of the neutron star if we want to make, uh, if we want to interpret the observations uh, that we that we have been uh, seeing, uh, and we will continue to see. Okay, so this is in terms of motivation. Um, I mean, at any point, please don't hesitate to ask questions. Um, uh, and now I'm going to basically uh, begin by um, by giving you a big picture uh, of uh, of the uh, high density matter. Uh, you've heard, um, I'm sure, lectures uh, where the finite temperature part of the phase diagram 
uh, was emphasized because that's the part of the phase diagram that can be studied uh, using lattice QCD uh, and using uh, heavy ion experiments. So here's a phase diagram uh, in, a, in, in a very simple version of the phase diagram. So this is temperature on the uh, y-axis, um, you know, just using um, uh, Kelvins uh, as, a, a, as a unit. I know we are more familiar, at least the nuclear physicists are more familiar with using MeV. Uh, we'll come back to using that later in the lectures. Uh, but, and uh, the x-axis is uh, density in grams per centimeter cube. <clears throat> so if you think about um, what we expect, we expect that there is a high temperature phase com consisting of quarks and gluons, uh, which is uh, described by QCD. And at low temperature and low density, uh, we know that the world is made of nucleons and nuclei. Uh, so there is, a, there is a transition between the phase containing hadrons uh, and mesons, uh, which are the low energy excitations of QCD. Uh, and uh, the phase at high density and high temperature where we expect uh, the quark degrees of freedom to manifest uh, uh, explicitly. Um, now, at low density, uh, if you think about uh, the state of matter, uh, which will be the main topic of discussion today, uh, we know that at low density, um, matter is made of uh, nuclei, but as you increase density, the nuclei become very neutron rich. And, uh, and part of this lecture, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll discuss why we expect this uh, evolution uh, of nuclei to become neutron rich. And then eventually, uh, these nu nuclei will disappear, uh, and they will form matter that is a very neutron rich, uh, made mostly of neutrons, but it will also contain a small fraction of protons. So uh, at some density, we, we think that the density is probably a few times that of nuclear density. So nuclear saturation density is a topic we'll discuss in this lecture, uh, is about two and a half times 10 to the 14 grams per centimeter cube. So somewhere between uh, a few times 10 to the 14 grams per centimeter cube uh, and 10 to the 15 grams per centimeter cube, we expect that the quark degrees of freedom should become very important. Uh, and this will be the topic of our discussion in the next lecture. Uh, but I'll just give you a preview of, of what, what to expect. At very high density, uh, QCD has, a, has an important property called asymptotic freedom, which means that the interactions between quarks are weak. And when interactions between quarks are weak, we can use uh, perturbation theory and some non-perturbative methods uh, like BCS superconductivity to study the state of matter at high density. Um, and uh, we have a controlled uh, theory uh, which predicts what the ground state of matter is at these very high densities. And, and one finds that at extremely high density, the state of matter it contains uh, a Fermi surface of quarks. Uh, and, uh, and at the Fermi surface, these quarks uh, have very important interactions that lead to uh, a phenomenon known as color superconductivity. Again, a topic that we'll discuss not today, but in tomorrow's lectures. Now, um, what's interesting is that uh, studies of neutron star mergers over the last uh, five or six years have, have begun to show us that in addition to heavy ion collisions, these very heavy ion collisions where the ions are neutron stars uh, produce conditions that are pretty extreme. Uh, and if we can figure out how to interpret observations of neutron star mergers, it provides us an opportunity to study this large swath of the uh, phase diagram because matter in a neutron star merger really uh, is not just very dense in baryon number, uh, but also very hot. So this is uh, another reason why uh, we, we need to develop uh, a framework in which to study uh, matter at high density and high temperature, uh, which will be the subject of these lectures. Okay, so um, given that background, uh, let's, let's uh, think about what uh, our current state of understanding is uh, of neutron stars. So this is our, based on the phase diagram, and now we just restrict ourselves to zero temperature. You see, this is what we think a neutron star looks like. Uh, uh, we think a typical neutron star has a radius of about 12 kilometers. 
at the surface, of course, the density is very small, uh, you know, but because of the high mass, uh, because of the high uh, compactness of neutron stars, the density gradient at the surface is enormous. So by the time you go about 500 meters into the neutron star, the density changes by about 11 orders of magnitude. And then, so the outer regions of the star is called the outer crust, uh, and it's made of nuclei and electrons. Uh, the inner crust uh, is made of nuclei, uh, electrons, and in addition to electrons, neutrons. Uh, and, and the outer core is made of neutrons, protons, uh, electrons, and muons. Now, as I mentioned in the, phase, in the discussion of the phase diagram, at a few times 10 to the 14 grams per centimeter cube, uh, we, we have good reasons to expect that a description in terms of nucleons is not adequate, and there's got to be some sort of phase transition uh, or uh, some sort of evolution of matter where the uh, quark degrees of freedom become important. We don't quite know for sure how this transition occurs, so that's why there's this large uh, region in red uh, where uh, uh, we say that there's some sort of emergence of quark degrees of freedom uh, and that uh, where both quarks and hadrons, uh, a description in both terms of quarks and hadrons may be relevant. And, and in this region, you could have states such as hyperonic matter or uh, matter containing mesons. So this is a really complex phase of matter uh, where we don't have any theoretical tools to really describe it. Uh, the big question is, do we encounter uh, high enough densities inside the neutron star uh, where we can provide a description solely in terms of quarks or weakly correlated quarks, uh, such as that that can be afforded by perturbative QCD? So it's not clear if uh, um, you know, some state of quark matter uh, similar to color superconductivity exists inside neutron stars, uh, but if it does, uh, it will likely have some important observable signatures. Are there any questions about uh, this part of the talk? Okay. Um, don't hesitate to ask uh, or even interrupt me uh, mid-sentence. Um, uh, so I'll, 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 uh, I'll assume uh, there are no questions and uh, move forward. Now, th that's the composition of the neutron star. Uh, we'd also be, we're also interested in what is the phase of matter um, at, at a given density. So at uh, low temperature, uh, the phases of matter inside a neutron star are very interesting. Uh, already um, in the outer regions, in the outer, you know, uh, 500 meters or so, uh, the, the matter is a, a solid. It's very similar to matter on Earth. Uh, it's made of nuclei and electrons. Uh, of course, the electrons are, are dense and, uh, and very relativistic, unlike electrons in ordinary solids. Uh, but in many ways, uh, the material in the outer crust is ordinary. It, it's very similar to matter here on Earth. Um, but already at about 500 meters into the neutron star, uh, something interesting happens with respect to phases. Um, the reason uh, this uh, there is a phase transition from matter containing uh, nuclei and electrons to a state of matter containing, in addition to electrons and uh, nuclei, uh, neutrons. Now, this state of matter remains to be a solid where all the nuclei form a, uh, a solid state because of Coulomb interactions, uh, but uh, the neutrons um, that are uh, in the regions between nuclei uh, are, uh, are superfluid. And the reason they are superfluid is because nuclear interactions uh, lead to pairing between neutrons of the Fermi surface. And that, that phase of matter uh, is, uh, is both solid and superfluid. And that's a very interesting state of matter, which we will discuss in, in some detail uh, in the, um, uh, later in the, uh, in the lectures. And now as you go further, um, the nuclei disappear. And when nuclei disappear, uh, the solid state of matter also disappears because the solid was um, basically uh, the lowest energy state of charged particles, charged uh, ions. Uh, and when the charge of the ions diminishes, uh, instead of making a solid, the ground state we think is a liquid, uh, a liquid made of neutrons, protons, and electrons. But again, 
interactions between nuclei, between nucleons, uh, neutrons and protons, uh, leads to uh, interesting phenomena, uh, superfluidity for neutrons uh, and superconductivity for protons. And, and as I discussed, we don't quite know what are the phases uh, of uh, matter when you have the quark hadron transition region or just the quark region. Okay, are there questions about this? Okay, is there a question? No. Okay. All right, so uh, let's start with uh, some, some preliminaries. So for the next 15 or 20 minutes, uh, I'm gonna tell you things that you all already know, uh, but I just wanted to do this uh, so that we can establish uh, some notation uh, and some uh, conventions for units. So I will use natural units uh, in this lecture, which means that I will set h bar equal to one, and I'll set c equal to one. Uh, later, when we do uh, finite temperature, I will set the Boltzmann uh, constant also equal to one. And people often ask me uh, when I teach this course to uh, graduate students, they are, you know, when you're not familiar with this, um, they always ask me, why is it that you choose to use these, event, uh, these, uh, these natural units? Uh, and I think it's useful to go through a simple exercise that I'm sure you were all done at some point, uh, is, uh, is to estimate the size of an atom, okay? Um, if you wanna estimate the size of an atom, uh, basically you have to first identify what are the relevant energies uh, in, for an atom. So there are two energies for the for the atom that's that's relevant. One is the energy of the um, nucleus, uh, and the other is the energy of the electron. It's clear that the nucleus is very heavy, and 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 its kinetic energy is 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 uh, negligible. So the only relevant kinetic energy in the problem is the kinetic energy of the electron. So if you write down the kinetic energy of the electron, uh, you can see this up in this box here. Uh, can you see my cursor when I move this on the screen? Can you see the cursor? Hmm, that's strange. Um, okay, but you don't see the cursor when this is... Uh, That's odd. Okay, let's see. Okay, all right. Let's uh, let's proceed. So you can see that uh, when you when you just have the kinetic energy, uh, which is p squared over two twice the mass of the electron, uh, you 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 can write down uh, the momentum in terms of the wave vector and the relationship between the wave vector k and the momentum involves h bar. And, uh, and, and so now we have a momentum, we have a wave vector, and we know that the wave vector is related to the, uh, to the wavelength uh, of, of the electron. So if we write down the kinetic energy of the electron in, in terms of the wave vector, we see h bar appearing explicitly. Uh, and, and then uh, here's the beautiful aspect of quantum mechanics. The only piece of information that you need to know uh, to kind of get a good estimate of the size of the electron is to realize that the wavelength of the electron must be two pi times the radius uh, of the electron orbit, uh, because that's the only way in which uh, the electron wave function can be single value. So, very instead of actually sitting down and solving the Schrodinger equation, just using the fact that the wave function must be single valued, uh, you can you you can make a uh, you can calculate what the kinetic energy of the electron is, and that's given by the the expression h bar squared over two times the mass of the electron times the radius of the electron orbit. Now, when it comes to writing the potential energy. Uh, you, you, would, you want to write the potential energy of electrons. Now the question is, what units are you going to use? I mean, you, if you use CGS units, you would get minus E squared over R. If you were to use SI units, then you would have these other symbols like four pi epsilon naught, which I'm not writing here. 
so units becomes important, uh, and now it becomes relevant to start keeping track of various uh, objects, h bar, uh, e squared, uh, and uh, and so if you if you choose wisely, you can you can try to identify a dimensionless number uh, that characterizes the strength of the interaction rather than just use uh, these arbitrary units uh, that depend on a specific set of uh, units. So if we want to calculate the ground state of the atom, the energy of the atom is given uh, by the, uh, the sum of the kinetic and potential energies. And you can, you can easily see that <clears throat> when, you have, uh, when you minimize the energy with respect to the size of the orbit, uh, that will give you the, the ground state of the atom. And when you do that, you find that the ground state of the atom are, has a radius r0. And when you write it all together, you, you, you find that you can define the symbol alpha electromagnetic, which is a dimensionless number, uh, which is e squared over h bar c, and that is just 1 over 137. Uh, and, and so if you identify in the problem uh, a, a dimensionless scale that tells you how strong interactions are or how strong a specific type of uh, uh, physical effect is, uh, then you can relate all relevant scales to fundamental scales in the problem. So the radius of, a, of the atom is related to the, to the de Broglie wavelength of the electron, uh, which is just h bar over mc. So that's the uh, wavelength of the, the Compton wavelength of the electron. Um, and and so the, the ratio of the Compton wavelength of the electron to the dimensionless coupling alpha electromagnetic tells you how big the atom is. So the, the, uh, the advantage of using these natural units is that you have some fundamental length scales or energy scales in the problem, and all of the emergent length scales uh, are simply related to these fundamental length scales in terms of some dimensionless numbers. In, uh, in this case, the only dimensionless number uh, is, um, is alpha electromagnetic. And you can do the same thing for the atom, the energy of the atom, uh, and, the and the fundamental energy scale in the problem is the mass of the electron. So the energy associated with the mass of the electron is just m times c squared, uh, but the atom, the binding energy atom is much smaller uh, than the mass of the electron, and it's smaller by this factor alpha squared. Uh, and the size of the atom is much larger than the, um, than the Compton wavelength of the uh, electron, uh, and, that, and it's larger because alpha uh, electromagnetic is very small. So we understand that if we set h bar equals c equals one, and then use this dimensionless number alpha, uh, we can find uh, very simple ways to understand uh, the size and the energy of an atom. So the reason uh, atoms are very big uh, is because alpha is very small and also because the electron mass is very small. If, so, so the reason we live uh, in a, you know, you know the, the density of matter on the earth is uh, about eight grams per centimeter cube. So the density of an ion atom, for example, is eight grams per centimeter cube. The reason is entirely contained in this fact that the electron mass is very small and the uh, alpha electromagnetic is very small. Okay. So are there any questions about this? Okay. So uh, the other uh, basic uh, quantity we'll need uh, in, uh, in these lectures is uh, some idea of, uh, of thermodynamics. I mean, I'm sure all of you have done this before. This is elementary thermodynamics, uh, but you know, it, 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 is, it is going to play an important role uh, in understanding uh, dense matter. So I'm going to uh, review some um, basic thermodynamics. Uh, we're all familiar that at fixed entropy, volume, and number, uh, a thermodynamic system in equilibrium minimizes the energy, the total energy. So the thermodynamic potential at fixed entropy, volume, and number is the total energy of the system. And, uh, and the differentials, the, the change in the energy for changes in the entropy, volume, and number 
uh, are related by this equation here, uh, where temperature, pressure, and chemical potential are intensive quantities. They don't depend on the size of the system. Uh, and those intensive quantities can be calculated from the energy uh, using these simple relations. Um, and so the chemical potential in, in, this, in, a, in a system where you fix S, uh, entropy, volume, and number uh, is calculated by taking the derivative with respect to the total number density at fixed entropy and volume. Um, uh, an important relation that you can get uh, from using the fact that the total energy, the total volume, and the total entropy are extensive quantities, that means they all scale with the volume, uh, is a relationship that's called the gibbs duhem relation, which relates the energy, the total energy of the system to the entropy, temperature, pressure, volume, and chemical potentials. So the first relationship up here that says that the energy is uh, temperature times the entropy minus pressure times the volume plus uh, the sum over the chemical product of the chemical potential times the numbers uh, is, is, a, is a very important and useful relation uh, that, that, is, uh, that will that'll help us uh, in, in understanding dense matter. Uh, for example, if you're interested in a uniform system, uh, for a uniform system, uh, the red, there is a simple relationship between the pressure, the energy density, and the number densities, uh, and that's given in the next line where it says that the pressure equals minus the energy density plus a sum over Ni times mu I, where Ni is the number density of a given species. Uh, and then there's also a relation, there's all, it, when you have finite temperature, there's an additional term that's proportional to the entropy per particle. But for example, at zero temperature, uh, you'd see that the, the pressure is simply related to the uh, minus of the energy density uh, under sum over Ni mu i. So this, uh, these relations uh, help us uh, later in the, in the lectures where we would want to calculate, for example, the pressure and we know the energy density uh, and we can use some of these relations uh, to calculate uh, all thermodynamic quantities if you knew one function. For example, if you knew the function of energy as a function of number density, uh, then uh, uh, you would know pretty much all of the other thermodynamic functions uh, using these relations. Uh, another quantity that's very useful uh, in, uh, in, in the study of dense matter uh, and in general in quantum statistical mechanics is the thermodynamic potential. And the thermodynamic potential is defined here as omega which is the energy minus the temperature uh, times the entropy minus mu i n i. Now, uh, you, can, you can use the gibbs duhem relation uh, to show that the uh, thermodynamic potential is really just minus the pressure times the volume. So it, it, at fixed uh, temperature, chemical potential, um, and volume, uh, the thermodynamic potential is the potential that is minimized. Uh, so if instead of fixing entropy, volume, and number, you fix chemical potential, temperature, and volume, uh, the system in equilibrium uh, minimizes the thermodynamic potential. It minimizes omega, uh, or in other words, because it's related to minus of the pressure, it maximizes the pressure. And again, these are simple thermodynamic relations that tell you if you knew the thermodynamic potential as a function of mu, t, and v, then you can compute all of the other quantities like pressure, number density, um, entropy uh, by taking appropriate derivatives. And, and, yeah, and you can construct many such thermodynamic potentials uh, by, by, by a process known as Legendre transformations where you can go from the thermodynamic potential omega to the energy or to the Helmholtz energy. So there are some general relations uh, that, that, that one can derive um, Gen what's known as a generalized thermodynamic potential. So you have to specify what are the control variables uh, and for a set of control variables, uh, there is a associated generalized thermodynamic potential that is minimized, okay? But the one that's really important in quantum statistical mechanics is, is this one where you keep chemical potential and temperature fixed. And, and we'll come back to, uh, to appreciate why it's better to study the grand canonical ensemble where we keep chem chemical potential uh, and temperature fixed 
um, rather than uh, study a system in which you try to keep the number density fixed. Okay, so um, still uh, we're we are gonna continue on uh, on with uh, some of the preliminaries. Uh, my apologies if, if all of this is very, very familiar to you, but uh, I always find it useful to set the ground rules uh, uh, before proceeding. Uh, so let's move uh, now to some very uh, reviewing, some very elementary aspects of statistical mechanics. Um, so we know that this thermodynamic potential omega uh, can be related to something microscopic. So thermodynamics is, doesn't really care about what the microscopics is. It's just relation between macroscopic quantities. Uh, but uh, statistical mechanics makes the connection between these macroscopic quantities uh, and the microscopic physics um, uh, through the grand partition function. So omega is minus uh, KBT uh, times log of the partition function. Uh, and the partition function is defined uh, here as a function of mu, t, and v. Uh, and it is a sum, you can think of the grand partition function as a sum over partition functions of the canonical system. A canonical system is usually specified by a finite number of particles, and that these finite number of particles have a degeneracy gi, and these uh, energy levels for these finite number of particles is given by EI. And so the canonical partition function, which contains a finite number of particles, uh, Z sub N is defined if we knew the energies, uh, eigenvalues for this N particle system, and we knew the degeneracy of that N particle system. So uh, you can basically use this formula to do something simple um, that uh, just to uh, be more concrete. So for example, an ideal gas of bosons, uh, an ideal gas of bosons has, uh, you can put an arbitrary number of bosons into each momentum state. So in other words, you can think of constructing a partition function for each momentum state. Uh, so this is a uh, partition function for momentum K so you just start adding all possible numbers of particles into this particular energy state, uh, EK, and, and then you sum over all possible numbers of states in, in a specific energy state, EK, and then you find that you can define a partition function, ZK, uh, which is just given by this factor here, where ZK is just a sum over putting arbitrary number of particles starting from no particles all the way to an infinite number of particles in that particular energy state. And, and you end up, so you, this turns out to be a, a sum that you can actually perform. Uh, it's a geometric uh, series, so you can sum the geometric series to get, uh, get an explicit answer. And uh, the thermodynamic relation uh, in the previous slide for example, tells you that you can calculate the number density by taking a derivative of the chem of the grand chem uh, canonical of the grand uh, thermodynamic potential. So you can do that. You can differentiate uh, the partition uh, the um, the thermodynamic potential, which you calculated once you know the uh, the partition function, uh, to calculate the occupation number of a of a state with momentum k. And so this basically you use this thermodynamic relation and the partition function that we just calculated in the previous line to find what is the occupation probability for bosons and you get the Bose-Einstein statistics from doing that. You can do the same exercise for fermions, but uh, now the fermion uh, partition function is very simple. You know that there can only be one fermion or no fermions in a given state. So the uh, partition function just has two, star, two terms, one in which there are no particles in the state and one, uh, and the second term, which is the exponential term, is the one in which you just have one particle in the state. Again, you go through the uh, usual definition of differentiating the grand potential with respect to the chemical potential, and, and you find that, uh, find the Fermi-Dirac distribution function. So uh, pretty much once you know the partition function uh, for a system, uh, the occupation probabilities for a state can be calculated. So this is a trivial case for the ideal uh, gas of bosons and fermions, but in a more complex system where there are interactions between fermions and bosons, the procedure is still the same. 
when you know the eigenvalues of the system uh, and its degeneracy, uh, you you can you can fully define the thermodynamic quantity. So this is important. It's it's very simple, but it tells us how to connect uh, a calculation of an n particle system with with eigenstates uh, to a thermodynamic quantity uh, like pressure, uh, energy density, uh, entropy, et cetera. Okay, so um, another uh, piece of physics that we'll use often in these lectures uh, is um, quantum many body physics. So we wanna, descri we wanna now describe or have a, a, a technology to calculate the energy eigenvalues for an n particle system. Uh, and that's how we get the thermodynamic functions that are relevant to describe dense matter. Uh, and to do that, uh, there are really two options. Uh, there's the first quantized Hamiltonian option, which is, which is something that everybody's familiar with, with uh, undergraduate quantum mechanics. So there, the central object is the many body wave function. So you have a Schrodinger equation and what's shown up there is the Hamiltonian uh, has the kinetic energy. So for the, for, for the purpose of the lecture today, we'll be dealing with non-relativistic systems. Uh, we, will, we will deal with relativistic systems in the next lecture when we talk, when we talk about quarks at very high density. Uh, but for the moment, uh, we, we are focused on understanding uh, nuclear matter where, where nucleons are mildly relativistic. And so it's not a bad approximation to think of them as non-relativistic particles. Uh, so if you have an, a, a collection of non-relativistic particles and you want to study uh, properties of this uh, of the system, uh, one option is the first quantized Hamiltonian where you, it's just the Schrodinger equation, but for many particles. And there's the kinetic energy and all of these particles could be in an external potential, uh, which is given by U. So that's a single particle potential. Each particle experiences a potential, an external potential U. Uh, but, uh, but the non-trivial part about uh, many body uh, quantum mechanics is these interactions between particles. And those interactions are here denoted by this function V, which depends on, it could depend on many variables, but in this simple example, it j j just depends on the relative distance between two of the particles being, con uh, 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 being considered. And uh, so if somehow you, you came up with a, a technique by which you can uh, calculate the wave function that sells, uh, satisfies the many particle Schrodinger equation, uh, then you solve the problem. Uh, but it turns out uh, other than in a, in a very select uh, class of problems, uh, doing this in general uh, is very hard. And uh, one often uses um, quantum uh, many body perturbation theory and quantum many-body perturbation theory is uh, is uh, is uh... okay. So you can see. Um... Wait, wait. You can see um, uh, the slides. Okay. Okay. So uh, we were talking about second quantization uh, as a way of describing a many body system uh, and, and what second quantization does, uh, which I'm sure, um, you know, you've, ex you've kind of uh, familiar with this from some earlier classes uh, is that it takes wave functions and it promotes them to field operators. Uh, and this field operator, um, is uh, is then develops is a is a create can act as a creation or annihilation operators uh, to make particles in your ground state. Uh, again, this is just a reminder. Uh, these field operators uh, satisfy an algebra, uh, and there are uh, you know commutation relations between these uh, field operators uh, that uh, depend on whether they are fermions or bosons. And the nice thing about this is that uh, explicitly the fermionic nature or the bosonic nature of your many particle system uh, is entirely contained in these commutation relations and, and, and you don't have to worry about, uh, you know, uh, about whether you're studying fermions or bosons and it just comes about uh, by using this, um, this, uh, 
this way of representing the many body problem. So for example, the Hamiltonian, which was just given as a function of, uh, of uh, gradients of the uh, wave function uh, and the uh, potential energy function, which just depend on, on the uh, distance between particles uh, times the wave function, uh, is now represented in terms of these operators where uh, psi dagger and psi that appear uh, in the bottom equation uh, are these uh, second quantized operators. And when you do this, you find, for example, that the potential energy uh, can be calculated as a product of uh, two density. So the density operator here is just psi dagger psi uh, calculated at the same location. Uh, but when you calculate things like the interaction energy, you see that uh, you have to order these uh, operators in such a way uh, such that all creation operators are on the left and all annihilation operators on the light are on the right, and that's known as normal ordering. So uh, there are certain rules that we have to follow when we write these Hamiltonians in second quantized uh, uh, um, formalism. Okay. So um, the, the reason uh, second quantization works uh, and is especially useful is, uh, for example, in the description of uniform Fermi matter. So uh, we, can, we can now think about momentum states as eigenstates of particles, because this is a uniform system and uh, translationally invariant systems, momentum is a good quantum number. So we should be able to write down the states of the system, uh, the general creation op operator Okay, good. Okay. Okay, can you see my uh, can you see my slides? Okay. Uh, so uh, the uh, creation and annihilation operators for specific momentum states of uh, particles, uh, say fermions, uh, are represented by C and C dagger. Uh, and uh, sigma here is just the spin variable associated with the, uh, uh, with the fermion that you're creating. Uh, and these momentum integrals that appear uh, are uh, momentum integrals that show um, uh, an integration over all momentum states uh, in three dimensions uh, and there's this factor of two pi cube uh, that 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 appears for all the momentum integrals uh, that's associated with the way we define Fourier transforms. And uh, so now, if we write down in momentum space the Hamiltonian, uh, the momentum space Hamiltonian looks uh, very familiar. It, it's got a one bar, one body operator uh, that uh, that has energy states associated with the fermions epsilon k, uh, and then it's got this two body operator that involves interactions. And uh, later we'll discuss uh, you know interactions of between three particles, which are determined by three body operator uh, interactions. But right now we just have a two-body interaction, which in momentum space uh, is V of Q. Uh, and V of Q is related to this V of X we had earlier through the usual uh, Fourier transform. Now, this uh, is very useful because it allows us to start representing interactions in terms of diagrams uh, and, uh, and provides a, a basis for doing calculations um, by summing various Feynman diagrams. Um, and uh, in this, in the non-relativistic context, uh, there are these rules that tell you how to calculate the contribution from a specific process. Uh, for example, one in which you uh, create two particles, and then you know, annihilate two particles with, with different momenta. Uh, and uh, this diagram here, for example, represents uh, a contribution uh, from the two-body interaction. And uh, so once you write it in second quantized form, uh, you can use uh, the tools of many-body perturbation theory and quantum field theory uh, to calculate the contribution of these, um, of these interactions in general. So, for example, this particle here, uh, there are two particles in blue, the fermions with momentum K1 and K2. Uh, they have some spin state alpha and beta. Uh, they interact by exchanging um, some momentum Q, uh, and this, mo this interaction potential V of Q uh, tells you what's the strength associated with that interaction uh, in this process. Okay, so uh, that allows you to calculate um, 
uh, uh, properties uh, of the of the state. Uh, but what we'd also like to do is figure out how to write down the partition function in second quantized uh, operators. And here again, I'm just reminding you of things you know. Uh, we know that the partition function is defined uh, by the by the first equation there, uh, but you can rewrite that. Uh, equation uh, in operator form. So now you're writing the partition function uh, in terms of operators, uh, second quantized operators H and N, uh, and where mu is the chemical potential associated with, uh, with that particular species. And uh, this is now, um, you might want to calculate something like the energy of a particle uh, or uh, the total pressure, uh, whatever is the operator that you want to calculate its expectation value, uh, you, can, you can write down the uh, expectation value in terms of traces over these operators. You can think of these operators as very large matrices that live in the many body space uh, and you're calculating averages uh, using something known as the density matrix uh, where uh, you know, the probability for a certain state, uh, which used to be given as just P lambda, uh, is now related uh, to this, uh, a, the second quantized operators H and mu uh, times the number density. So this allows you to calculate energies, et cetera. So let's, if we apply this method to a very simple system, let's say that we want to calculate uh, the So what appears here is epsilon is the energy density, n is the number density. So you have some uh, one species of fermions. Uh, you can think of it as neutrons or protons, just one uh, uh, isospin uh, degree of freedom, uh, two spin degrees of freedom. And you can say, well, let's calculate the energy of a Fermi system. And in general, you're going to find that the energy of a particle is given by the kinetic energy of filling particles up to a certain state at zero temperature. Uh, and that kinetic energy uh, in the non-relativistic limit for particle is three-fifths uh, Kf squared over 2m. And then there's this complicated uh, function that comes from all the two-body interactions that you know one needs all, a sophisticated technical uh, calculation, uh, many-body perturbation theory, or some other uh, non-perturbative method to calculate it. Uh, what I want to emphasize here is the form, we don't know what the functional form of V of N is, and that's something we'd, we'd, we'd uh, delve into later in the lectures, but there can be, in general, either attractive or repulsive forces in a uh, Fermi system. So if I just plot the energy per particle as a function of density, this is you know, arbitrary units, which means you just have to pay attention to the qualitative behavior of these curves, not so much to the numbers themselves, uh, you see that there's a certain behavior of the energy per particle uh, of a non-interacting gas, okay? Because the momentum, the Fermi momentum, uh, the energy per particle goes like Fermi momentum squared, uh, and the density of matter goes like Fermi momentum cubed. The energy per particle uh, basically goes like n to the two-thirds, where n is the number density of particles. That's shown by the blue line. Now, if you have uh, a linear term in the energy coming from two-body interactions, you can add that term, uh, and if it's repulsive, you're going to increase the energy per particle because two-particle interactions are now increasing the energy of each fermion. A and so, uh, in general, there can be... Uh, <laughs> I don't know what to say. It's very unstable for some reason. I've never experienced this before. <laughs> I don't know what it is. Uh, but uh, let's try uh, to just try to wrap this up. I don't want to, um, you know, maybe tomorrow I will try to be at work early enough so that we don't have to deal with this um, uh, internet connection at home. Uh, but, um, yeah, this is a problem, very problematic. Sorry. Hold on. Let me uh, let me just uh, try to get back to the talk. Okay, so um, we were talking about um, what happens. Can you see my slides? 
Okay, so I'm I'm going to try this format just because I think the other format may be using up more bandwidth. Uh, so let me just try this format. If you can see my slides, that's good enough. Uh, and so what 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 you're seeing here is the fact that there are two possibilities uh, of corrections to a Fermi system. If it's uh, repulsive, then it increases the energy per particle and it increases with density. Uh, and so quantities like the pressure, which are the derivatives of the energy uh, per particle with the third line uh, on the left-hand side. Uh, and you see that if it's a, a repulsive, then the pressure is always finite and increasing with density. Uh, but the other option, which is uh, attraction, especially if the attraction is strong, then V of N is a negative, makes a negative contribution to the energy per particle. So one immediately realizes that if you have large attractive interactions in a Fermi system, uh, then the energy per particle can decrease with energy with density. And that means that there is an unstable region in the um, density plane. Okay, And that's important. It illustrates two things. It illustrates that in principle, you can't specify a uniform system by its density. Uh, and it is actually much better to think about uh, a chemical potential rather than density to describe the state of, uh, of a system at zero uh, uh, temperature. Uh, and it says that when you have attractive interactions, uh, these attractive interactions can lead to a, uh, a state which is unstable. And th in this unstable state, the density keeps increasing until there's some kind of repulsive forces that are encountered so that it can stabilize the system. So uh, a Fermi system with strong attractive interactions is stabilized if, when it reaches a density where the repulsive interactions between the fermions becomes large enough uh, so as to prevent the collapse of the system. So because the um, uh, density uh, required to um, obtain the stability is finite, uh, all densities that are less than that finite density uh, just don't occur in nature. So uh, the, the consequence is that interactions fundamentally change, uh, especially attractive interactions can fundamentally change uh, the nature of a Fermi system uh, when you have uh, strong attractive interactions. So this is, uh, this is really what happens with, uh, with nuclear matter. Uh, nuclear matter is a gas of neutrons and protons. Uh, and when you try to calculate uh, the energy per particle, you in fact see that there is a, a, um, um, a more complicated function. So here's a, a, a plot of uh, the neutron matter and the nuclear matter energy per particle. So you can see uh, essentially that there are two terms, which are the kinetic energy uh, terms associated with neutrons and protons. Now this is a two component system containing neutrons and protons. Uh, and then there is this uh, really important but uh, complex uh, quantity, uh, which is a quantity that depends on both the neutron uh, density and the proton density. Uh, we'll discuss how, to, how we will calculate this um, uh, later in the lecture series, but this is a function uh, which, we, uh, which we think is, uh, makes a negative contribution to the energy uh, up to about twice nuclear density. Uh, so what you're looking at here in the lower plots is the energy per particle uh, e over A uh, is A is the total number of particles, E is the total energy uh, measured in uh, MeV. And along the uh, x-axis is the density of fermions. Uh, this is just the density of baryons uh, divided by, the, uh, by a fiducial density, which is called N0. That is the density uh, at which uh, nuclear matter saturates. That's the density at which uh, uniform state containing equal numbers of neutrons and protons uh, has zero pressure. And uh, densities below that, uh, the pressure is negative. So if you look at the blue curves, for example, so that is uh, for a state of matter in which you just have neutrons, no protons. Uh, you see that the kinetic energy of neutrons uh, is large. That's given by the blue curve on the left panel. Uh, 
Uh, and the potential energy is negative. It, it's mostly attractive, even up to the highest densities that we encounter. And, uh, and so, but the sum of those two, which is shown in the right panel, is still positive. Uh, and that that's that's and it's well behaved. It increases with density, and so the pressure is always finite. So pure neutron matter is a perfectly good state of matter. Uh, it exists. It can, in principle, exist at any density. There are other problems with pure neutron matter because neutrons are unstable. Neutrons will always decay to form protons, but for the hypothetical case of pure neutron matter, uh, the interactions are attractive, but they're not strong enough uh, to make matter unstable. Uh, so uh, in contrast, if you look at the black curves, uh, the black curves uh, are for a state of matter containing equal numbers of neutrons and protons. Uh, and in this case, uh, you see that the kinetic energy is a little bit lower than that of uh, a pure neutron gas at the same density. And the reason for that is because there are two species of fermions, uh, and uh, when you have two species of fermions, each of them equal in number, then the Fermi momentum for each of the species is at the same density. So the kinetic energy of a symmetric state is lower, but it turns out that the potential energy is actually larger uh, because the attractive nature of the interactions between neutrons and protons is, is significant, and, uh, and that leads to a much lower, uh, uh, much larger negative potential energy for nuclear matter, which destabilizes matter as shown in the right panel, and you see that you have to get to a density of, uh, similar to N0, uh, to uh, to find a curve uh, that has zero pressure. So the curvature uh, tells you, um, uh, the, de the first derivative tells you about the pressure, and so until you get to the point where the first derivative is, uh, you know, is at the point where the first derivative is zero, you end up uh, with a stable state of matter, okay? So this is, uh, this, this is the underlying, um, um, properties of neutron matter and nuclear matter uh, that we have to take into account in constructing, uh, in constructing any state of matter uh, that's relevant for neutron stars. Okay. Are there any questions about, uh, about, the, about this discussion? Okay, so, um, so there are certain properties of this bulk nuclear matter and neutron matter that we can deduce um, from observations of nuclei, the study of nuclei uh, and properties of nuclei. Uh, and these properties that we deduce for bulk matter from studies of nuclei are called empirical properties of nuclear and neutron matter. Uh, and we know these properties only at one density. It is at the density at which we find a nucleus, and, the, and that's known as the saturation density. And the saturation density of nuclei contains about 0.16 fermions per Fermi cube. Okay, so 0.16 nucleons per Fermi cube, uh, and at that density, we we think we know that density fairly well uh, by studying nuclei. Um, and uh, that density, at that density, the energy per particle in a in a state of matter containing equal numbers of neutrons and protons, which is given in the second line is about minus 16 MeV. So that's the sum on the uh, kinetic and potential contributions. The curvature, the, the first derivative of the symmetric nuclear matter curve shown in blue is zero uh, uh, by definition because that's the uh, stable point uh, at low density and zero pressure. Uh, the second derivative tells us how easy it is to compress nuclei. Uh, and uh, this is known as the compressibility. So the second derivative with some prefactors, in this case, uh, nine n zero squared, uh, is is a measure is a measure of the compressibility of, of uh, nuclear matter, uh, and that is also something we know from experiments uh, on nuclei, uh, where we excite a, a specific type of resonance in a nucleus known as a monopole resonance, where the nucleus has a breathing mode and it just oscillates. Uh, we also know something about what happens to nuclear matter when you try to make it more neutron rich. So the blue curve has equal numbers of neutrons and protons. So the proton fraction, which is denoted usually by the symbol XP, is one half. Uh, 
If you try to make matter more neutron rich, then XP, the proton fraction, uh, decreases. And in pure neutron matter, the proton fraction is zero. By studying nuclei, which are more neutron rich, which contain more neutrons than protons, you can begin to ask how much energy might be uh, might be present in a pure neutron matter state, even though you can't make a nucleus uh, entirely composed of neutrons. So you look for small departures from uh, symmetry, and then you use a, uh, an extrapolation formula uh, to estimate what the energy of pure neutron matter may be. So the symbol S, which is the difference between the energy density of nuclear matter and the energy density of neutron matter divided by the density um, is, is known as the symmetry energy of nuclear matter. And that symmetry energy can be measured again, and it's, it is expected to be 32 plus or minus 2 MeV uh, from studies of nuclei. Another property that's, uh, that can be uh, inferred um, uh, from studies of nuclei, but which is, which is at the moment not very well known, uh, is a quantity known as L. Uh, L is related to the, to the rate of change of the symmetry energy with density. Uh, and you know, this is actually a very important uh, parameter to, for uh, neutron matter because that is related to the pressure of neutron matter because it's the first derivative of the energy with respect to density. And, uh, and that has this uh, definition called, uh, which is in the, in the bottom line, says that this parameter L is three times the density uh, times the derivative of the symmetry energy with respect to number density. And that is from a theory that I will discuss later. Uh, it's expected to be between 50 uh, plus or minus 15 MeV. The experimental determinations of this uh, at the moment are not very good. And, uh, in, and there are plans to improve this in the future. But these are the empirical properties of, of nuclear and neutron matter that any theory of dense matter must, uh, must account for. OK. Um, now, there are two things that we learned from this very, very simple exercise, uh, that the fact that you have a, these attractive interactions uh, implies that you bind every particle uh, in nuclear matter has a large binding energy. Uh, and we also learned that there are these densities for symmetric nuclear matter uh, that are prohibited. They are unstable regions uh, where whenever the density is less than n naught. So um, how do we use this information? Uh, and the best way to think about using this information is, let's see if I can make this a little bit bigger. Uh, one second. Okay. Okay. Uh, does that look a little better, a little bigger? Okay. So, um, so one thing we learned is uh, density is not a good variable um, because it can be uh, there can be forbidden regions. Uh, so, at low temperature or at zero temperature, uh, the best variable to study phases of uh, dense matter uh, is the chemical potential. Now, the chemical potential, uh, you can think about in what happens to matter uh, when you increase the chemical potential. So um, when, you when the control parameter is the chemical potential, uh, the thermodynamic potential that we discussed earlier, uh, omega, uh, is the relevant quantity. So that is minimized. Uh, any state that minimizes uh, omega is the ground state of the system. So the way... Uh, if I take the QCD vacuum and I apply a chemical potential for baryon number to the QCD vacuum, um, in the absence of interactions, now if I just ignore all the interactions between neutrons and protons, the chemical potential, when the chemical potential is less than the mass of the neutron or the proton, which we will approximately equate here, uh, nothing happens. So the QCD vacuum uh, doesn't have any response uh, to a chemical potential because to create a particle containing baryon number, you need at least the uh, chemical potential as large as the mass. So shown in this white curve with a, with a label crossover uh, is a simple case where you ignore interactions between neutrons and protons altogether. 
Uh, and in this case, what you would find is that as you keep increasing the chemical potential for baryon number, you go from a state that contains no particles to a state in which the number of baryons increases smoothly from zero uh, according to what you would expect for an ideal gas of uh, neutrons uh, when the chemical potential is larger than its mass. But we already know that that's not what happens in nature. We know that the neutrons and protons have attractive interactions. So when the energy is equal to the mass of the particle, mass of neutrons minus the binding energy, and the binding energy in this case was about 16 MeV. So even just supplying the mass minus the binding energy uh, is adequate to generate a finite density of nucleons. So what happens is shown by this blue curve. So in QCD, if you start with uh, no particles and a small chemical potential and keep increasing the chemical potential, at some point when the chemical potential approaches the mass of the neutron minus 16 MeV, there is a phase transition, which is a first order phase transition, where you go from a state containing zero baryon number to a state containing N0 baryon number. So that's a large first order phase transition because you went from a state containing no particles to a state containing you know, basically a density of 10 to the 14 grams per centimeter cube, uh, which is the nuclear saturation density. So this is the first uh, interesting uh, phenomena in QCD. And this is a phenomena that we still don't understand from first principles, uh, you know, someday in the in the distant future, maybe Lattice QCD can do this calculation, where just like you do the calculation at finite temperature, uh, I uh, from looking at the lectures that you have heard, you've heard about the finite temperature phase diagram, and there there are many methods one can use. One can use the hadron resonance gas model, one can use lattice QCD directly, uh, and to see what happens when you take the QCD vacuum and turn up the temperature. Uh, and there, it's very clear, when you increase the temperature, you make a pion, you have a smooth crossover uh, into uh, high temperature quark gluon plasma. It's strongly coupled, uh, but it's a smooth crossover from a gas of hadrons and mesons, uh, which are weakly coupled uh, to a gas of strongly coupled uh, quarks and gluons. In, in at finite chemical potential, the story is interestingly different. Uh, what is happening is uh, shown in this figure. You, you go from zero density to a very large density of equal numbers of neutrons and protons, uh, and that is the um, uh, first phase transition in QCD. Okay, so far, we've, we've neglected uh, two important things. Uh, we've neglected the fact that uh, these, uh, this nuclear matter phase that we've created is electrically charged. And we've also ignored the fact that um, Neutrons and protons can decay, neutrons can decay by weak interactions. So in the absence of weak interactions and in the absence of electromagnetism, uh, this, is a, this is what happens in QCD at low density. So you have no matter and then you have matter that's very dense. Um, and, um, and what we want to now discuss is what happens when we include um, uh, the, the, the fact that there are electromagnetic uh, interactions and weak interactions between, uh, between uh, neutrons and protons. Are there any questions about this? Okay, if there are no questions, uh, so the, the, um, the two conditions that we need to impose on matter that actually makes matter much more interesting uh, uh, are uh, is charge neutrality and beta equilibrium. Uh, stable bulk matter must be electrically neutral. So at low density, we know that the only charged components that we have in nature are protons and electrons. So the number density of protons has to be equal to the number density of electrons. Uh, and we also know that if you allow for enough time, all of the reactions that can convert neutrons into protons must occur. So they must be in equilibrium. 
So electron and a proton can combine to make a neutron and a neutrino, and we'll assume that the matter is not not able to trap the neutrinos, so the neutrinos leave the system. Uh, in which case, you're gonna you're gonna need to have um, equilibrium uh, conditions, which is uh, just defined as the uh, chemical equilibrium between electrons, protons, and neutrons. And for chemical equilibrium, you need the chemical potentials uh, to satisfy this relationship. For example, the electron plus proton chemical potential must be equal to the neutron chemical potential. In general, uh, chemical equilibrium is determined by conserved charges. So the way to think about the problem is we have uh, in uh, the standard model, uh, there are certain charges that are conserved. Um, the, the ones that are relevant to ours right now are baryon number and electric charge. So there's no way a system can get rid of baryon number or electric charge. Uh, and in addition, you want the electric charge to be always zero in total, because otherwise the electrostatic energy cost is, is infinite for large systems. So um, you, you have two chemical potentials that ensure that your state has, uh, has a conserved uh, number of uh, baryons and electric charge. And we can assign these chemical potentials. Uh, uh, mu B is the baryon number chemical potential, and mu Q is the, quark, uh, is the uh, electric charge chemical potential. So uh, the chemical potential for any particle uh, in equilibrium is related to these two chemical potentials, and it and to know uh, and it can't depend on anything else. Uh, the chemical potential is is def just depends on the baryon number of the particle, bi times the baryon chemical potential, plus the electric charge of the particle, qi times the uh, um, electric charge chemical potential, mu q. So, for example, for a neutron, it has a is zero, baryon number one, so the neutron chemical potential is just the baryon chemical potential. Uh, whereas the electron chemical potential uh, is uh, just minus mu q, because the electric charge of an electron is minus one, uh, and, the, uh, and it has no baryon number. And the electric charge chem uh, and the chemical potential for protons, uh, which has baryon number one, and electric charge one will be mu baryon plus mu q or mu baryon minus mu e. So in a, in a general system uh, in, in dense matter, uh, these two conditions uh, impose important uh, constraints on the state of matter. So we've studied energy of a gas of, or a liquid of neutrons and protons, uh, and now we are realizing that we need to add one more dimension to the problem. We can't just think about a problem in which we fix the potential, but we need to fix also the electric charge chemical potential, and the electric charge chemical potential should be fixed in such a way that it's, it satisfies a beta equilibrium and in addition, we have to worry about the electric charge of the system. So dense matter is really uh, a uh, phase diagram. Even at zero temperature, it's a phase diagram of two chemical potentials, uh, the baryon number chemical potential and the electric charge chemical potential. OK, so, um, so we can't study. To study uh, the phases of dense matter, we really have to think about understanding the phase diagram in this mu b, mu e plane, OK? Uh, mu e is just another way of writing the electric charge chemical potential, because the electric charge chemical potential is just minus mu e. So you can either choose mu q and mu b, or you can choose mu e and mu b, uh, the electron chemical potential and the baryon chemical potential. Now, now let's just look at this figure. The first, uh, just w looking at the bottom uh, part of the figure, you see that uh, when the baryon chemical potential uh, is larger than the mass times a mass minus the binding energy, you produce nuclear matter, right? So if the electron chemical potential was zero and you have mu b greater than mass of the nucleon minus the binding energy, 
the state of matter that you produce uh, is not the vacuum because the vacuum has lower energy than a state of matter containing uh, neutrons and protons. Uh, so that region is denoted by blue. The dark blue is a phase of neutrons and protons, uh, and it's positively charged because there's no other uh, charge to compensate for the charge of the protons. Now, as you increase the electron chemical potential, you start producing electrons very quickly because the electron mass is very small. So as you move along the y-axis, and uh, if you're at low baryon chemical potential, the population that you produce in the vacuum is one of electrons. So you make a lot of electrons. So as you go up along the um, y-axis, you keep increasing the electron density. So at each point in this two-dimensional phase diagram, you can calculate the energy, the pressure, the thermodynamic potential, and ask which phase has the lowest free energy. So at small mu b and large mu e, the phase containing electrons is favored over a phase containing nucleons, but it's electrically charged. So as soon as you put Coulomb uh, energy into the problem, you're going to find that there's a large energy uh, cost associated with making a dense gas of electrons. Uh, at small values of electron chemical potential, you see that there is a um, uh, favored phase contains uh, neutrons and protons. And then again, there is a positive cost associated with having electrically charged uh, protons in the ground state. Now, in between these two phases is a first-order phase transition shown by that red curve. So what, what is happening along the red curve, the gas of electrons has the same pressure, same free energy as that of a gas of neutrons and protons. So this is a first out of phase transition with two conserved charges that allows you to create a state of matter that is electrically neutral by combining positively charged nuclear matter with negatively charged electrons. So everything that surrounds us is in this state of matter where you have two phases, you have the electron phase and you have the nuclear phase and they are in equilibrium uh, because they can be at the same pressure uh, and they can be electrically neutral uh, by just combining the volumes of individual components so that the total charge is zero. Now, as you increase the chemical potential, at some point, the baryon chemical potential will be greater than the mass of the neutron. When that happens, it is no longer possible to just have electrons in the electron phase because now the chemical potential for neutrons is larger than the mass. It is it is favorable to produce neutrons even in the phase containing electrons because the chemical potential is larger, large enough to, to source neutrons in the electron phase. So you go, you make this transition from a phase containing only electrons to a phase containing electrons and neutrons uh, when the chemical potential exceeds the mass of the neutron. And that's shown by the first dashed line uh, in, in, the, in the figure. Now you can continue along that path, and at some point you'll find that is no longer possible because the two states of matter begin to look very, very similar. So even the state containing neutrons uh, and electrons begins to have protons in it, and at that point uh, you have a transition where uh, you can only make a uniform state of matter in which uh, neutrons, protons, and electrons all coexist. And along that state of matter, that's the, uh, sh that's the dashed curved line uh, that is extending into the uniform phase. And there is a very specific trajectory where mu e changes in a, in, according to the function shown there uh, with mu b so that the electric charge on that trajectory is zero. So if it was a little bit larger, it would be negatively charged. The mu e was a little bit smaller. Yes. Yes. Yeah. The dotted line that you see uh, to the right uh, in, the, in, the, in the uniform phase is the phase of matter that is electrically neutral and is in beta equilibrium.
Uh, but at lower densities, uh, what you're seeing is that the best state of matter is not uniform matter containing uh, neutrons, protons, and electrons, but one in which you have nuclear matter combined with electrons or nuclear matter combined with electrons and neutrons. Okay, are there any other questions? Okay, so based on this analysis, this is what we think is happening in dense matter. So at low density, the system is, is electrically neutral by enforcing charge neutrality globally. So at low density, you have uh, a nucleus, uh, which is really just a blob of nuclear matter uh, surrounded by electrons. Uh, as you increase the density, at some point, the chemical potential becomes larger than the neutron mass. So the electron gas also has neutrons, but it also has, it is in equilibrium with this nuclear matter phase. Uh, and then eventually, uh, the only state of matter allowed is one in which uh, there's no first order phase transition between nuclear matter and this gas of electrons. Uh, there's just one phase in which you have neutrons, protons, and electrons. Now, this should look very familiar because the, um, the, lower, the lower density phase just looks like an atom. It's just a nucleus with a bunch of electrons around it. Uh, and so this is just smoothly continuously matching to uh, what we know happens at very low density where you have a just ordinary nuclei surrounded by electrons. Uh, but now this, in this way of thinking about it, uh, you, you have a, a unified picture that allows you to make the transition from nuclei to nuclear matter. Uh, but uh, whenever you have uh, two coexisting phases where electric charge is only neutralized on a uh, global scale, which means on the scale of uh, unit cell, um, there are other energies uh, involved in the problem. So in addition to the uh, energies of the electron gas and the, and the nuclear matter phase, uh, there's the energy due to the Coulomb forces uh, in each of the charged phases and because you have a surface between uh, the nuclear matter phase uh, and the low density phase. So the nuclear matter phase here is shown in blue and the low density phase is shown in cyan. So we have to pay this extra cost associated with surface and Coulomb energy uh, when, when, we, uh, when, we, when we study low density matter. So um, the best way to think about this then is to think about nuclei as a very special case. Uh, nuclei that exist at low density are just drops of nuclear matter surrounded by electrons. A and there's a lot of empirical evidence that the liquid drop model of the nucleus works very well. So if, for example, in this figure, you see that the density of nucleus uh, inside um, uh, in the central regions is almost a constant. So what's shown in the, in the figure there is the density profile uh, of lead, um, uh, molybdenum, uh, calcium and oxygen. And in, in all of these cases, even in the smaller cases, you see a smaller nuclei, you see that they always have the same density at which uh, of about 0.16, which is the saturation density uh, at which you have um, uh, the favored state. And, uh, and so this is, this is basically uh, the, the evidence that uh, thinking of nuclei as drops of nuclear matter is an is a, is a, is a extremely good approximation. And you can also see how uh, the A number and the Z number change with radius, uh, and these are consistent with having a, a saturation density uh, in, uh, in, the, in, the in the nucleus. So this uh, leads to you know, a very successful model, uh, very simple but incredibly successful model for describing uh, nuclei uh, called the uh, uh, liquid drop model. And the liquid drop model contains just a few parameters. So it contains uh, the bulk nuclear matter parameter where all of the nuclear interaction physics goes into it. So all the nucleon-nucleon interaction physics goes into determining uh, the bulk parameter, which we think is about 16 MeV, minus 16 MeV. Uh, in this particular fit, which is a fit to the binding energy of a large number of nuclei to this simple formula, uh, shows that you know even for moderately um, uh, for even for medium mass nuclei with A numbers of order 20, 
reasonable job uh, of predicting the binding energies. So at the, at the maybe 10% level, the energetics of all nuclei uh, can be well described uh, by this very simple formula uh, where you break up uh, the energy into a bulk energy, uh, and then there's a symmetry energy, which is the energy cost for changing neutrons into protons. Uh, that's also associated with nuclear interactions. And then there is the Coulomb energy associated with the fact that you created an electrically charged object. And then there is a surface tension uh, because the, the nucleus has a finite surface. So uh, based on these um, um, four considerations, there are just these four terms that give rise to, uh, to the uh, energy per particle, uh, binding energy per particle. Yes. Yeah, that's a that's a very good point. So in this very simple model, if you fit, you get a very small uh, uh, symmetry energy, and that's because in principle there should also be a surface contribution to the symmetry energy. So uh, in a more sophisticated model, you can, count, you can have a surface contribution to the symmetry energy, and when you include that, this, it improves a little bit. OK, so, um, so the, uh, the analysis of dense matter in terms of these two phases uh, containing electrons and nuclei, uh, you, you have to account for the surface and Coulomb energies uh, to calculate you know, how, much, uh, um, is this, how much energy is associated with uh, electrostatic forces and, surf, uh, and, and producing a surface. And, and this is a, a fairly straightforward exercise that you know uh, that I would certainly ask you uh, to do. There's a problem at the bottom of the slide that you can try to calculate yourself. So you can ask a simple question: uh, What is the best nucleus uh, that you can produce uh, in nature? Uh, and because nuclear matter uh, has a binding energy of minus 16 MeV, uh, in the absence of surface and Coulomb uh, energies any chunk of nuclear matter has the same binding energy. So there is no preferred size. The preferred size for a nucleus comes from the competition between surface and Coulomb energy. So the surface energy is just 4 pi sigma, uh, where sigma is the surface tension times r squared. And you can calculate the Coulomb energy of a sphere. You've done this before uh, just by calculating, you know, just integrating uh, the total charge uh, in a in a nu in a spherical uh, nucleus, uh, assuming that the charge density is roughly uniform, and by doing that, you get the Coulomb energy, which is shown in the uh, in the expression to the right, uh, and you see that the Coulomb energy goes like the proton fraction squared alpha electromagnetic a squared uh, over r. Uh, 